basically today I'm going to talk about search. I'll give a little brief overview of the past, present, and future. It'll be a survey on a variety of topics meant to familiar, familiarize yourself with some of the problems that uh, we see when we're working on search. So basically, what is search? So I'm going to start with that. Um, you've all heard used search engines in the past. Um, everybody uses search multiple times a day. Previously, there were search engines like Yahoo, Ask. I don't know if everybody, anybody remembers Ask Feeds back in the day. Um, Google, of course, is kind of the dominant player in the market right now. There's also Bing. Um, there's also a variety of privacy options coming up. So for example, DuckDuckGo focuses a lot on private search. Ecosia kind of focuses on social good. So when you search, they plant trees. Um, I work at U.com, which is a company that's focused on personalized search as well as private search. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a variety of um, search engines out there, but you know, search is actually even broader than search engines. So there's search kind of happening at an enterprise level within companies for a variety of reasons, like searching internal documents. If you're thinking about mail, Gmail also in some ways is a search engine over mail, um, in addition to allowing you to send and receive mail. Um, any forum, like for example, Reddit has their own search functionalities. Um, so search is actually a very broad problem um, that affects kind of multiple disciplines. So in order to talk about search, I think that the academic discipline most aligned with search is something called information retrieval. So if you kind of look at the Wikipedia definition of information retrieval, it's basically defined as searching for information in a document, searching for documents, and then also searching for other things. Um, so they also describe in this, in this little snippet, text, images, or sounds. So information retrieval can technically be limited, is not limited to a single modality, although the most common form of information retrieval and the most useful one in daily practice is text. Um, another definition that I find a little bit more precise is from Professor Manning's book, Introduction to Information Retrieval. So this one is basically defined as finding material of an unstructured nature that satisfies an information need within large collections. So if we kind of break this down a little bit, the first point is finding material of an unstructured nature. So if you are looking for structured information, databases are very good. So search is kind of different than database lookups um, because we're actually dealing with unstructured information, which makes it a little bit more of a challenging or a little bit of a different problem. Um, and then the other point is large collections. So when we talk about search and information retrieval, we're usually operating over very large corpuses of information. If you had a small corpus of information, then you may not actually need to develop robust search techniques. Does anybody have any questions on kind of what search is and what information retrieval is before I move on? Cool. So I'll now talk about relevance. So when we think about search, the goal of the search system is to provide relevant information to users. Um, but as you can imagine, relevance is kind of a little bit of a subjective term. And it, you know, how you define relevant. Um, and what relevance means matters a lot and probably differs from domain to domain. But when you think about general search, um, you, can you can kind of think about you know, different types of search categories. So one might be facts. If you're looking up when was Barack Obama born, the relevant information is quite obvious. It's just literally the year or date that Obama was born. Similarly, with the, what is the population of California, it's likely going to be a number. But then you know, there's also deeper levels. Like when you think about population of California, are we talking about, um, or if it's like, you know, a more specific city like San Francisco, are you talking about the greater metropolitan area? Are you talking about within the city itself? Um, so you have to understand a little bit about the intent. When people usually ask things like that, they're talking about the greater metropolitan area, uh, but sometimes they're not. So a lot of it's actually understanding intent. And this is kind of what makes relevance a pretty tricky issue. Another one is recommendations. So if you say, what movie should I watch into a search engine? Um, the relevant information there is also a little bit less defined as in the facts case. So for example, you know, if there's a new movie coming out, um, I recently watched that movie, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. So I mean, that might be a good recommendation based on recency. Um, so there's, but at the same time, there's no exact answer. So you have to take into account popularity signals, et cetera. If you look up best countries to visit, similarly, I think a lot of this goal of the search engine becomes to provide reputable sources. So you wanna have people who really know our travel guides, et cetera. Um, so you wanna take into account Signals, for example, PageRank could be useful as well. Um, another type of category of searches is something like research. So for example, you know, if you're typing in information retrieval papers, you're not looking for a single answer or a single movie or a single date. You're looking for kind of a set of information. Similarly, if you look up how to paint a wall, um, you're probably not looking for one method. You're looking for kind of different methods and you wanna find a variety of sources and maybe even extracted snippets from those sources to allow you to do your job. Uh, similarly, if you're doing a task, say you're filing immigration forms, 
um, again, search is kind of useful for connecting people and making that type of stuff more accessible. Um, is there any, I guess, I don't know, do that, people have any questions about relevance or, I don't know, does anybody want to kind of think of another category I might have missed here of different types of searches that you've done maybe today or yesterday? If you have questions, also you can dive into Zoom to uh, have your question in the chat room. So we don't have questions so far, but I do have some questions later. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll keep moving on then. So now let's talk about search systems. So when we're building a search system, there's a variety of considerations that we have to account. And this applies to very specialized search systems. Um, it applies to bigger search systems as well. So, you know, general search cases are, you know, companies like you.com and Google, um, where we're trying to kind of service a variety of, um, you know, search methods, like basically a variety of queries, not related to any specific topic, but really general. But you can also think of in the space of healthcare. So this class kind of focuses a lot on AI and healthcare as well. Imagine like electronic medical records. There, that also can be thought of as a search system. Um, there's a lot of unstructured document and clinical notes. So when you're searching, um, a lot of these considerations still apply. And yeah, I'll go through some of them. Um, but so one would be relevance. So is the information relevant to the user? So when building a search system, you'd want to kind of benchmark and measure how relevant the information you're providing is. A second important consideration is latency. So usually we, me we measure latency on the order of milliseconds. Um, because at, you know, at today's level, you know, Google has kind of trained all of us to expect search to be really fast. If you're above you know, a second or you're measured in seconds, that's often very slow for consumers. But of course, this, this can differ based on the discipline. But in general, uh, we want to operate on the order of magnitude of milliseconds. Um, and it could be like, you know, 100 to like 600 milliseconds. Um, again, it depends a little bit on the use case, the user, the system, et cetera. Uh, user interfaces are very important for search systems. Um, so when we think about a user interface, I think there's two fundamental questions that we have to answer. One is, how do we present the information to the user? Um, do we, you know, do we give them the snippet? Do we give them links? Do we give them uh, links plus content plus, you know, some reviews? And then also, how do we accept input from the user? So do we allow people to kind of, are they asking a question? For example, if you think about Alexa, it's kind of, you know, voice-based input. But if you think about, you know, the most typical uses of search, people are typing into a keyboard, into a little box. Um, so that's kind of the user interface from the input side and then also the presentation side. Experience. So one thing we think a lot about is, is the information actually actionable? So if we give you information, does it allow you to take action from there? So action can mean multiple things. In one case, action might be, um, you know, finding the next link that you want to click on that kind of brings you closer to the goal you were searching for. Action might also be like, a, you know, an actual tangible thing. You might be looking for plane tickets. Action might be, you know, buying a plane ticket there on the spot. Or if you're looking for recipes, action might be, you know, copying the recipe that you want and, you know, actually making a, you know, I don't know, banana bread, if that's what you were searching for. Modalities are another question. So what search modalities do we support when we're building a search system? Um, you know, text is, as I mentioned, the most common one, but there's also image search. Um, there's, you know, in terms of like, you know, ingesting input, you know, voice recognition, et cetera. Throughput is another question. So this also depends on your intended use case, but how many queries per second can you support? Um, so for certain systems, if you don't have that many users, mm -hmm. it's probably not that important, but if you have many users and you wanna to scale to hundreds of millions of users, throughput becomes very important, as does cost. So another, you know, another really important consideration is how expensive is the search system to maintain? Um, and you know, there's multiple factors that can drive cost, one of which is, the most important of which is probably gonna be the indexing cost, because you have to store the information and indexing is in general expensive because um, you need it to be stored in a way that can be retrieved very fast. And it kind of dies back into latency. So there's often kind of trade-offs between relevance, latency, costs, and throughput. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of some of the considerations of search systems. Um, does anybody have any questions on some of these considerations? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question regarding. Oh, okay. Sorry. Do you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, regarding the question regarding the trade off between relevance and latency, can you take a bit of feedback to that? Is it kind of like that? Oh, wait, sorry, I can't, I can't actually hear you. <laughs> Can you, can uh, you the trade off between re relevance and latency. Like, is it, I, if you consider the trade off between relevance and latency, is it that you mean kind of like if you would want to show the showcase the most relevant um, search, then you could go through like brute force, you know, in your recommendation system, and otherwise you can do like something like LSH, or is it like 
I, I just wanted to ask you if you can go a little bit deep into how you kind of like make this trade up at you don't come. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, I, your voice is a little bit grainy. My mm -hmm. my apologies, yeah. but well, I think okay. your question um, it seemed to be what is the trade off between relevance and latency um, mm -hmm. in practice, right? And going a little bit deeper onto that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, that's that, that's a great question. So and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later in the talk when we go into some of the more technical concepts. But you can imagine that um, having, as you mentioned, a brute force approach could you know provide more relevance if you're able to you know, look at more information within a document and do more computation, you're likely to improve relevance at the cost of latency. One simple example might be long documents. So imagine you have um, a corpus of 100 million really long documents. You might be able to surface more relevant information if you um, do some type of processing that looks across all of the information across all the documents. Um, another approach might be to only look at the summary field of each of these documents. So that's a very simple example of how um, one approach might have lower latency, but the other one might yield more relevant information. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot. I think you also mentioned some techniques like LSH, et cetera, like hashing. Um, yeah, I mean, there, but I mean, the goal is really to provide relevant information at low latency. Um, so we do want to kind of optimize on both to the degree we can. And I'll go more into some of the technical details there. Does that answer your question or do you have another, did you have something more specific in mind? No, that's good, thank you. Cool. Does anybody else have any questions on some of the search system considerations? Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the high level architecture of common search systems. Um, so in general, when we think about search systems, um, there's some steps that kind of go there. It's almost, you can think of it as like a pipeline. So a query is what the user inputs into the search system, expecting some type of relevant output. So the query comes in. Um, oftentimes we do things like query transformation. What this means is we might want to transform the query, normalize it, um, you know, do multiple versions of the query um, based on kind of what we see from other users, et cetera. So we can transform the query, um, understand the intent behind it a little bit better. Uh, we then bring it to a retrieval system. So retrieval is usually, when people talk about retrieval, we're thinking about kind of generating a large set of candidate documents from an even larger corpus. So you can imagine if we have billions of documents or hundreds of millions of documents, the retrieval step might get 100 or 1,000 um, of the relevant documents. And then re-ranking is kind of the last stage where once you have some of these documents, you want to re-rank them in an order that will be best for the user. Because when we think about search, um, really precision and recall are very two very important concepts. Um, I'll, I'll assume you all kind of understand what those are, but you can imagine that precision is really important for search. Um, recall is also important, but um, you know when you have hundreds of millions of documents, there are likely going to be you know more documents for a specific topic than a user can you know ever read. So that's why precision becomes important. Um, if you show a user you know the wrong document at the first link, they're going to be that's going to be a pretty poor user experience. So precision is generally very important, but of course you want to have you know recall be good as well. And again, usually people only look at the first couple links. I think one of the things to think about search is that it's really um, uh, people you know are often trying to find information very fast. Um, you don't want to burden the user at all. So you want you know, relevant information to come up first. But yeah, so that's kind of some of the steps in the pipeline of you know, common search systems. And this again applies across domains from web general web search to more specific search um, within you know, EMRs, et cetera, or even within mail, like you know, Outlook, for example. Uh, so here I have a question here. Yeah. So you, query, basically can be divided into two types. One is informational query, and the other one is called navigational query. So informational means, for example, if I type in COVID-19 treatment, and I don't know the ground truth, so therefore precision is important. Right? If you're missing some much better articles, because I have no idea their existence, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't complain. But for navigational means like something like, something like type in Michael Jordan, and you give me uh, the researcher, Michael Jordan in Berkeley, and most of people will be offended because they want to look at this uh, basketball player, right? In that situation, the recall will be critical. So do you have to handle uh, kind of classify search type internally or how do you deal with the trade-off? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually a great question. Um, and again, I think the things I'm talking about are, you know, concepts that are in the public domain. I can't go too much into 
a lot of the specific technologies we use, but at a high level, um, it, it is important. And it, it depends on the domain. Like, as you mentioned, domain can be defined as, are you searching, you know, for travel or for recipes or for, you know, something like academic research. So that's one, you know, level in which one could classify a query. The other one is the query itself. As you mentioned, there's informational and navigational queries. Um, and I think one thing is, you know, a lot of it comes down to the evaluation infrastructure. Um, so, you know, when you think about recall and precision, as you mentioned, the trade-offs might be different between the two different types of queries. And we would want to um, be able to kind of have good metrics on both types. Um, in general, it's kind of, you know, it's nice to have end-to-end -end systems. Um, having lots of, you know, special like logic for different queries um, can also make sense. But, you know, as we see, like, you know, and, you know, this is not just limited to search, but, you know, just generally, um, you know, problems driven by AI, like self-driving, it's often nice to kind of be able to wrap everything end to end and learn a lot of this, um, you know, through, you know, deep learning approaches, et cetera, to avoid kind of, you know, having separate classification models, et cetera. But sometimes, you know, it is necessary in practice. So it's kind of a difference between um, domain. Yeah, it, there, there's a little bit of um, nuance to it, but yeah, in general, it's definitely a good point to be aware of. And also, also, I think so far you talk about search engine in general, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, eventually you talk about what uh, the delta between U.com and the Google search. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you did mention about uh, query transformation in the end of the slide, right? Query, then you do query transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine. So like query, query rewriting, you can do two, two or three kinds of things. One is that you want to consider a person's contextual information, like location, right? If I type in pizza, you want to say, well, I don't want to display pizza in, in Europe. I, I know you are in, in California. And the, the other possibility is if I type in Toyota, you say, well, maybe uh, I don't have too many results about Toyota and I can give you Honda and maybe BMW. So I, I uh, in addition to the, the semantic kind of query expansion or be more specific based on contextual information, what are, are the kind of query transformation I, I think the search engine will perform? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So I think one very simple example is spell check. Um, a lot of the, you know, also a lot of the point of query transformation is to make the retrieval step easier. Um, so query transformation in and of itself is not useful insofar as it kind of helps the retrieval process. So you can think of this as being a joint problem where the query transformation, retrieval and re-ranking all have to work in close like lockstep with each other. But one simple example would be spell check. Um, if the user misspells something, uh, we can kind of you know correct that at the query transformation level <clears throat> and that can help with the retrieval stage. Um, other examples might be adding information. Um, if you know certain things, you know maybe that can help personalize it. Uh, if you're looking for a certain fridge, um, I don't know, maybe there's some, you know, based on other signals, we can kind of specify the query a little bit more. Um, we can also do multiple queries at once if we want to. That's kind of a more compute heavy approach, but if you want to maximize your, you know, retrieval, uh, you might want to um, transform it in different ways. But yeah, I mean, there, there's like a, probably a, a breadth of approaches. Those are just a couple. I think spell check is probably the most um, intuitive example. Okay. okay, there's another question I can ask is, uh, is people consider not in the, in the big data era, uh, Google is really hard to be beaten. Mm -hmm. the, the reason is the following, because Google like uh, in uh, 1998 when they get started, because I, I was their classmates, and they use page rank, right? That paper was never really published uh, in, in, a, in a conference, but the paper is well cited. And page rank, everybody knows, right? You have an important page, lots of important pages point to your, your page, then the ranking of your page can be higher. And they found out there are lots of, lots of spamming kind of cheating techniques. Uh, so my team uh, in 2000 or so, we were working on spam fighting. We want to get rid of kind of cheating websites. But about in 2010, then page rank was pretty much stop to be utilized because Google has already collected so much data. So when the user feedback to the search results, they click on, let's say I give you 10 results and most of the user in California, they click on the second one. The people in Connecticut, they click on the third one. 
So eventually they know, well, from the user feedback, I don't, I, I can just give you the, give you the ranking right there. I, I don't need to have this uh, generic or universal uh, uh, ranking system, which is easy to spam. So if that's true, they call the system net boost. If that's true, the more data about user you have, and uh, the better the quality will be, and how can you compete with Google? And I, I, this is this is a caveat. I, I had another story. You know, I knew uh, the 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 leader of Bing.com really well. And if you trace back to Bing.com's history, and uh, Bing.com when the Explorer was pop, still very popular, so Bing.com did the following thing, and I was caught by Google. So Bing.com when you do you use Explorer do a Google search. And B.com will, will record the search ranking of Google's. So that means Google itself is, is kind of recording which one you click, right, for, for the search results. So they can do this uh, collaborative filtering. But B.com did not have a successful search engine. They, they couldn't collect signal, but they were dominated 10 years ago on Explorer navigate, navigators. So they collect that data within their browser. And uh, that was called by Google. But Google can do this little games can be played if you are interested in. Uh, so how, how do you comment on that? I mean, how can you dot com? You don't have a browser, and you cannot cheat, and you don't have a lot of users to start with. And uh, okay, so <laughs> yeah, that that's a that's a great question. Um, and yeah, that is the challenge, I guess. You know, um, there are at some level there are economies of scale when it comes to search. As you mentioned, user signals are important for any search system. Um, I think we think that we have some creative ways of um, kind of bootstrapping and developing a system and kind of building our functionality in a way that, um, you know, uses um, like user signals that we get, but also is able to kind of provide an initially good experience out of the box. A lot of it is kind of focusing on, um, you know, like innovative presentations of information, et cetera. Um, having a different way of um, like servicing information to the user is a lot of it. But yeah, I mean, you, you are right that um, like, you know, there are advantages to having large amounts of user data that you can train and fine tune models on. And, you know, that's what we see Google has done um, as well as Bing and kind of a lot of folks who build search engines, um, you know, user feedback is, is obviously very important. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't really give a, a clear answer and I can go a little bit more into like u.com questions at the end. Um, I could talk a little bit about that too, if, if there's interest, but um, yeah, I unfortunately can't go too deep into the, the specific technology right now, um, but I think, you know, it's going to come down to developing a good experience that users like and draws them away from Google, uh, focusing on things, you know, like privacy, like innovative apps is what we call them. So I talked about you right before. Um, so we see that kind of is interesting to users and brings them in because it's functionality that you can't see other places. If you want to generate code or if you want to like, you know, look up code snippets, we also have an app called, um, uh, it's basically a code generator, U-Code. It's a, I guess like it's it's a code generation app where you can actually generate code using like a neural model. So these are all things you can't do in Google right now. So the idea is that by making like some key bets there along with just lowering our foundational strength in search and allowing for more personalization, uh, we can kind of compete. So that, that's kind of a, a one answer is, um, you know, that different presentation, personalization as well, Google is kind of a black box. Um, you don't really get to personalize what you see. So we can focus on that a little bit. And then also privacy. Um, so it's not all about just relevance. It's some, some of it's also about privacy, not tracking users, um, and generally kind of um, being respectful. So yeah, those are, those are some ways in which we think we can differentiate. OK, thank you. Maybe uh, more questions later. Yeah, so now I'll kind of talk a little bit about classical information retrieval. Um, so classical information retrieval deals with um, like, you know, the, the kind of problem setting is you give it a corpus of text documents and a user query. We want to provide relevant documents in a ranked order. Um, so when we think about classical IR, one of the most important concepts is an inverted index. So an inverted index is basically a common efficient data structure used to index and support keyword search over documents. Um, as you can imagine, um, it basically is like a mapping from words to documents. Um, but you can think that this might be really sparse. A lot of words may not be used in a lot of documents. Um, so you kind of want to have a sparse encoding of it. And there's kind of very efficient ways of doing this. 
And this, this is a kind of very old technology. It's been used for a while and it still actually is very useful. So some questions when it comes to inverted indices are how do you tokenize documents? Thinking about things like stemming um, we can do. So stemming basically means that if you have a plural word, can we kind of normalize it into its stemmed version? And that way we can do it to put the query and the document. Um, so we can kind of be a little bit more robust to those types of things. Um, another you know, important concept is calculating relevant scores from the query and document. One common approach is called TF-IDF. Uh, so TF-IDF stands for term frequency, inverse document frequency. The idea here is that you know, if a term, if you're looking up a query, a query is composed of terms. If a term appears multiple times in a document, that document is likely to be relevant. But you know, if documents are, you know, you know, if you, you also have to normalize by how often that term is in documents. So if that term is a really common term, we probably want to kind of downweight that as well. So that's what the inverse document frequency does. Um, so you basically multiply these two terms and you have a score called TFIDF. Um, and you know, in practice, what you might want to do is something like this, where you have a query consisted of many terms. You basically sum the score of every single term um, within the query against the documents, and you're able to compute a score. So TFIDF is kind of the very traditional approach. Um, in practice, uh, BM25 is like the fancier, more effective method commonly used in large-scale search systems. Um, mm -hmm. So BM25, and if you're curious, you can kind of read more online. There's, it's a little bit more of a complicated formula. I definitely recommend that you look into it more if you're interested, but the idea is that you also penalize longer documents. So 25 also means there's like 25 versions of it. So it's something that has been iterated on for a while and you know, has found to be effective in doing a keyword search. We talked about query expansions a little bit. And then also learning to rank is also important. Learning to rank is basically, can we like train, you know, very simple models based on document fields um, to, you know, be able to better provide, uh, like improve relevance. So for example, a lot of fields are textual, but some are not. You can imagine likes, for example, as like a popularity signal. So we need to be able to kind of learn and kind of, you know, use all of these different signals, whether they're textual or non-textual. So this is kind of you know the state of classical information retrieval. Um, kind of the next evolution is really neural information retrieval um, or neural IR. Uh, so as you can imagine, one of the limitations of classical IR is that keywords is not equal understanding. Um, you know, there's been a ton of advances in NLP over the last five years, uh, most significantly with the rise of these large pre-trained language models or large language models, um, which are able to kind of also understand the semantics a little bit better instead of just the keywords and some of the lexical, you know, uh, format of the word. Um, so the so basically the question is, can we take advantage of recent advances in NLP over the last couple of years? And the answer is yes. So, you know, these pre-trained language models or language models produce embeddings that you can, you know, that correspond to both the queries and documents. And then we can use this in techniques like semantic search. So semantic search is kind of asking the question of, can we efficiently use embedding models to search over large corpuses of documents? And the answer is, yeah, yes. So this is actually something that's, very new right now. So it's kind of the cutting edge. There's a lot of research happening here. Uh, one question you might have is when you're doing using embeddings, um, you can imagine it being very compute heavy. So imagine you have a query and you have embeddings for every single document in your corpus. That could be hundreds of millions of documents. Um, you know, even if you're able to pre-compute the embeddings for the documents, you don't know what the query is ahead of time. So you may need to, if you wanna just do a very simple method, you would embed the query, you would compare it to every single document, and then you would surface the top 10 documents by score. You can imagine that's going to be very slow and latency is an important search system consideration. So the way we solve this is using techniques like approximate nearest neighbor search. So ANNs allow low latency retrieval from dense representations. If you're curious about learning more, you can look into this uh, technique called HNSW, Hierarchical Navigable Small World Graphs. And there's also open source solutions like FACE. Um, so FACE is you know, um, a way of kind of creating some of these ANN uh, clusters so that you can do and take advantage of some of these advances if you're doing embedding lookups. So yeah, now I'll kind of move into a little bit of neural IR as it relates to re-ranking. So this is a little bit different. So this is assuming that we have retrieved K documents. Uh, we want to generate a score for every query document and then sort the documents by score. So some of the retrieval approaches we described earlier, earlier like VM25, can generate a small set of candidate documents that we then want to re-rank. Um, and when we talk, think about re-ranking here, um, this is kind of going back to one of the students' questions earlier, uh, latency versus performance becomes a little bit more clear. Um, and I'll go into a specific kind of example of a trade-off. 
Um, but the task itself is we have a candidate set of documents, we wanna re-rank them and we can now use fancier approaches because we don't have to look across the entire corpus, we're looking across a subset of the corpus. So two important kind of techniques are things called bi-encoders and cross-encoders. So bi-encoders allow you to embed the query and the document separately, and then you can basically do a cosine similarity or dot product, et cetera, in order to get a score. The advantage of bi-encoders is that you can kind of pre-compute the embeddings for all your documents, and you could take advantage of advances like a and n, approximate nearest neighbor search. But you can imagine that um, it's a little bit limited because you don't, or you're not able to kind of get interactions between the query and documents. So that's what where a cross encoder comes in. A cross encoder embeds both the query and document at the same time. Um, and the idea is that you pass in the query and document through a language model like BERT, and you know you're doing interaction over all of the tokens. So all of the query is interacting with all the document, and you're able to kind of get some type of score that you're able to train, and that's able to kind of as you can imagine, uh, be a lot better signal of relevance. But this is where latency comes into play. If you're doing the buy encoder, it's gonna be fast and cheap, uh, or maybe not cheap, but it'll at least be fast. If you're doing the cross encoder approach, uh, latency is probably gonna be more of a consideration because you actually have to um, pass the query and document together and you can't really predict what the query is gonna be beforehand. So this is kind of a nice image from this paper called Colbert. Um, I actually recommend there's a class at Stanford called CS2024U, 2020, uh, I think, um, in which they have a section on information retrieval, uh, which, you know, is it's nice if you all have, um, if you're interested in this topic. Um, I'm not sure if there's other, I don't think there's too many information retrieval specific courses, but there are, like, I guess some courses like 224N is also probably going to be important, um, which is a, a NLP class. But basically at a very, I'll just quickly go through some of these paradigms. So one is representation-based representation similarity. That's what I described before. We embed the query and document, and then we kind of compute like a cosine similarity or dot product. Another one is you can imagine kind of constructing some type of uh, matrix based on the query and document, and then doing like CNNs, convolutions, et cetera. The other one I mentioned, the cross encoder approach, all to all interaction. We embed the query and document together, and you can see that there's this rich set of interaction happening. And you can use the signal at the end. And then in this paper, they talk about kind of another approach in which we uh, still kind of do something called late interaction. So you're not doing, you don't basically have to use all the layers of the transformer. You can basically, you can cache um, the layers, like the last layers of the documents. And then when you embed the query, uh, you still have to embed the query and like from the beginning and pass it through all the layers of the transformer, but you can use the last layers of the document and use some type of um, mathematical operations in order to kind of simulate a little bit of the all-to-all -all interaction. So, Sahil, a, a question here. Yeah. Uh, query seems to be pretty short compared to the length of a document, right? Yes, yeah. A query, I remember Google's uh, statistic, a query typically would be like less than three words. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, the embedding of query and the embedding of document, uh, they are in, in kind of different, I would say in different space. Dimensionality could be different. The query embedding cannot be a very you know, very sparse space, right? The very sparse space doesn't make sense. So query typically, uh, you do a semantic classification of the query, whether the query is belonging to, let's say, Apple. You say, okay, this Apple is this an IT Apple or it's an agricultural Apple. It's kind of coarse grain classification, semantic classification. Then you go for the documents, documents also classify uh, in, in, semant in a semantic space. But when you talk about embedding, that's really fine grain, similarity fine grain comparison. I, I, don't, I don't know how helpful that could be. Yeah, that's uh, so you're basically your question is um, queries and documents are very different. How do we, and that's a great point. And I'll, yeah, that's actually one of the challenges in the field is the documents can be much longer. So there is a concept called like symmetric search and asymmetric search. Symmetric search is basically when your query and document have similar lengths. So you can imagine that a document might have something like a title field. In that case, the query and document do live in the same space. If you define the document to just be a title or a, a very small field of the document. But as you imagine, documents are much bigger. So then we're dealing with asymmetric search. I think the idea here is that you can still put them in the same space, um, but you would need to train a model that kind of takes that into account. So there's actually a lot of uh, so sentence Transformers is kind of a, 
initiative. Um, and I think it's kind of, yeah, so they talk, they have like a lot of uh, models, um, some of which have actually been trained on the asymmetric search task. Um, so I think you're, you're right um, that it does pose challenges, but there are approaches that are developing where um, the models are specifically, there's like different embedders for the query and different embedders for the document, and you can put them into the same space so you can do a comparison. Does that kind of make sense or? Uh, that's okay. I mean, without any of details, I, I think at high level, I, I, I got the idea. Uh, Richard Socher, right, he, he published a paper, his team in Salesforce about four or five years ago about modeling all the NLP tasks into just a QA model. Right? Like I, I, I gave an example, if you say you want to do translation, you can, you can say, what is the translated version of this English document in French? French. French. So uh, uh, in GPT-3 right now, they also have this kind of in-contest uh, test learning. It is really similar to Rich's idea five years ago. So here you have a query, right? If you can um, formulate query or search into a QA model. So I query something, you don't just return me to, 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 to point to some, some documents, but you aggregate the documents, you summarize relevant information within the document, and that, that will be much more relevant. But my problem right now in a lot of searches is I really, I mean, you give me the entire paper, I have to really search for the most relevant articles, I mean, those most relevant paragraphs, and that's kind of very painful. So do you, do you, are you, do you think in one of user experience, you.com will endeavor will be some sort of like fine, fine grant query or fine grant QA kind of, kind of system? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we're probably like whatever provides the best experience for our users and fulfills kind of that need, we'll, we'll definitely explore. I mean, a lot of it, you know, a lot of what we do right now is you can see kind of summarized content from the web. So if you look up and you kind of see some of our apps, we do summarize a lot of the content from the web page, um, but I think you're right. I mean, I think there are a lot of exciting advances, you know, QA models, et cetera, um, that you know, um, you know, we'll keep investigating and we'll likely, um, yeah, like you, like, but but our focus is really on like the users and what we think will kind of provide like a you know an innovative like user experience. Um, I can't go too much into details about like um, some of the technology and stuff, but I can talk to kind of other things happening in the public domain. So for example, I think one cool thing is, um, I know, I think there was like a model released by OpenAI, I think it's called like WebGPT, mm -hmm. where they look across different documents um, and try to summarize it. Um, one of the problems with using GPT-3 is that, you know, there's no trust there. Um, GPT-3 has no guarantees on its output. So if you look up when was Obama born using GPT-3, um, you know, it's kind of just, it's very probabilistic. You don't really have guarantees that the answer will be correct. Um, so that's also like, you know, thinking about trust, thinking about, you know, providing facts. Um, those are some of like the, the values, I guess. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a little bit, it's, it's interesting. A lot of these neural approaches, like especially the generative type approaches um, have some pretty clear downsides, but I think that, you know, there's cool research going on. I know at like Stanford and um, a bunch of research institutions um, on NLP and it's like kind of, you know, it's proceeding at a really fast pace. So it's, it's exciting. I don't know if that answered your, that probably didn't answer the specifics of the question, but does yeah, that- Yeah, that, that's, that's a high level answer, I, I kind of okay. But if you get into dig, digging to find grant, uh, it's really tough. Let, let's just want to use your one very simple query, say, okay, mm -hmm. the, the war in, in Ukraine, what, what is the latest status, right? So there are two issues. One is you need to get re relevant documents. And also, like you said, GPT-3 doesn't know whether the document is a fake one or it's a real one, right? Now that's the one issue, fake or real or credible. And number two, it's uh, when you talk about one event, even COVID, uh, the timing is very important uh, because if you talk about, if you summarize documents, even that document is, is very prominent but that was published last year. So how do you prioritize when you do summarization? Like if you talk about the war situation in Ukraine, perhaps the news this morning is more important than the news yesterday. And uh, at Google, this is a big struggle because they do not want to have a new website 
to show in a prominent place right away because they call they, they, they talk about top, top rising query top rising top rising results when you have a top rising result it tend to be a spam page right? people can game your system to have their advertisement uh, highly ranked so this trade-off thing timeliness and, uh, and and top rising so i gave you an example in 206 206 google started this uh, Beijing branch and there uh, was a very kind of uh, interesting story the next day so we started we had a huge ceremony press event let's say on May 1st okay and on May 2nd you see Baidu search engine you search on Google whatever they show the top result be Google launch a new division in China but Google itself has no that, that news until a week later because they want the information to gain their ranks in time. So all those kinds of problems will affect your summarization quality, right? Those are really nitty gritty details. Yeah. Uh, when we do research in, in university, we will typically say, well, you give me a whole bunch of documents, they are equally important. You don't consider citations, you don't consider timeliness, or maybe some papers result already been invalidated by the uh, future papers or, or subsequent papers. So how could, one deal with that kind of question. I'm not trying to pick your brand or gain to you.com's uh, secrets. I'm trying to say there are lots of other problems just in addition to just uh, relevance. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. I think, I mean, what you stated is spot on. Um, there, there's a lot of different you know, issues. I think you talked about uh, recent news being an example. Um, like, how do you know if a query is, you know, merits having a news source at the top? Um, that's something we think a lot about. Um, so we have, for example, these different apps that we show, some of which are kind of news related, and we do have to think about that. And you're right, it is a, a very nitty gritty problem. Um, and there's like tons of very like little nitty gritty issues um, that happen in practice that often we don't really see in research, um, or at least aren't as emphasized in research. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I don't have too much to add to what you said. I think what you said kind of summarizes a little bit of the problems there. Um, there are, I guess, you know, solutions, like obviously like we can, like, you know, there are, you know, approaches one can take. So I'm sure Google, for example, um, looks at and tries to, you know, have some type of understanding of the query, whether this is a type of query that's kind of information, like a news type query, et cetera. So I think a lot of it has to do with intent and understanding. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, other methods as well. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, so I think one really important concept when it comes to building a search system, and again, this applies to any search system. So if you're building search for mail or search across medical information um, or search for like, a, like an EMR system, um, some pretty standard metrics are you know, concepts like average precision. So, and when we talk about precision, usually in the search setting, we talk about precision at K, where K is a number of the first results that you returned. So usually things like K at five and K at 10 are important because actually in practice, how many times do you actually go to the second page of the search results? Probably very few times. You're usually looking at the first page, which has around 10 results in traditional systems. Um, so average position is important. Average recall is also kind of a useful metric. Mean reciprocal rank is also an important one. Um, so, and again, if you wanna like actually learn more about these, I would just look them up. These are pretty standard terms, but mean reciprocal rank measures the first relevant document. Um, so basically, if the second document is a relevant one, the reciprocal rank is going to be one divided by two or 0.5. And then mean simply implies that you're going to get the average across many queries. There's mm -hmm. concepts like average precision, which is kind of a way of computing precision across, you know, various ranked documents. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one is normalized NDCG, normalized discounted cumulative gain. Um, this is kind of a different type of metric in that you're using relevance mm -hmm. labels. So it can take into account not just whether or not a document is relevant, but how relevant it is. So for example, you can have like four grades, one, two, three, four. And NDCG can kind of measure how well the search performs, take into account the rank of the document as well as its, um, its graded scale. And again, this is like a very, I don't expect you all to understand all of these metrics at a deep level just um, from this one slide. But if you're curious, you can just definitely like look online, there's tons of resources and you can look into the formulas and stuff to get more of a, a deep understanding. But the idea here is that the metrics are averaged across multiple queries in a test set. 
And these are some of the standard ones that you might want to look more into if you're building search systems. Does anybody have any questions on evaluating search systems? Yeah, so I, I guess on the topic of evaluation, uh, benchmarks are important. So there's some publicly available benchmarks. So for example, benchmarking IR or BEIR, um, it had a really interesting table. So over here, you can see that um, we off, it's actually quite interesting because BM25, which we discussed before, actually performs pretty well even now compared to a lot of the neural approaches. So you can see here average performance versus BM25. And a lot of these deep learning approaches have negative performance compared to BM25, which is quite fascinating, um, especially because a lot of them are very specific to certain domains. So even if they do better on a domain like MS Marco, um, they do a lot worse on domains like outside of that. Yeah, they don't transfer across domains basically. So we see that BM25, um, surprise, it still performs pretty well. Um, there are approaches like here coming up um, and especially using BM25 plus cross encoding seems to work really well, um, but we don't see that many improvements. So this is quite exciting because it means that there's a lot of room to grow in terms of neural approaches. Um, but it's also interesting because the lexical approaches still, um, you know, when we're looking at zero shot performances, do pretty well. Um, so it's a little bit of, I talked a lot about the promise of neural IR. I'm also like just briefly mentioning that there still are a lot of limitations. And speaking of limitations, some future, you know, research directions, one is long document search. So language models have token limits. So BERT has a limit of 512 tokens. This can be quite um, important when you're talking about, you know, trying to understand large sets of documents. And this is why inverted indices still work pretty well um, because they're very, they're designed to handle really large documents because you're just literally looking at the keywords. You don't have to embed and understand all of it. Um, that kind of brings us to the question of how do we effectively embed long documents for semantic search and neural re-ranker, uh, re-ranking. So there's techniques like long form or et cetera that have come out. Um, and I think Professor Chang may have talked about it in a previous lecture or a future one when he talks about NLP. Um, another concept is how do we effectively chunk long documents into smaller semantic pieces? So these are all kind of topics related to long document search. Um, how do we combine lexical and semantic search effectively? So can we kind of take the best of both worlds? Um, when we get to semantic search, are there better approaches for fine tuning embeddings, different architectural improvements, training procedures? When we train you know, these types of models, often you deal with triplets, which is like a query, a positive example, a negative example, and you use some type of cross entropy loss to you know, fine tune the embeddings to kind of be better aligned with relevance. Um, so how do you effectively, efficiently capture contextual information with the query and document jointly? Transfer learning, can that be used in, multi, in IR? Uh, multitask learning as well, kind of, you know, what is the, the future there? Um, another, con another kind of research direction is learning to rank. How do we incorporate non-textual signals with textual signals well? And then lastly, I'll kind of leave it with a multimodal search. So I think multimodal search is going to be very interesting, but can we search within various modalities? So if you look, can we actually provide documents as well as images at the same time? Or if you want to just do image search and also, you know, maybe in more specialized search modalities and fields like healthcare, multimodal search becomes important. A lot of healthcare deals with images um, as well as kind of unstructured text, um, as well as structured text. So multimodal search is kind of a very interesting um, area of, you know, innovation. Um, but yeah, so these are some of the future research directions and I'll, I'll just leave it at that. That's... Um, I've been talking for a while, but I hope you all, thank you all for listening. And I'll, I'll just hang on if you have a couple of questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Questions from? Um, I think I can also unmute here if you mute real quick. Yeah, I can hear you much better now. So I can mute, right? Yeah. Um, does it work this way? Yeah, yeah, this is perfect. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering because last time I remember when you were presenting the um, the uh, project ideas, you were saying that currently you don't monetize the product and you are thinking about um, actually doing non-personalized ads. And I was thinking whether you ever looked as a company into stuff like the Brave browser and its association to like crypto that you're being paid for advertisements and what your take about like these um, kind of like, I mean, it's not necessarily search, but these alternative browsers are and their approach. 
Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, also, Professor Chang, do you mind if we just stop recording for the this session? Just this part of it?